evening, campers. It's me, Kieran. I have been waiting for this book for literally a decade. Burnham Wood. Cast your mind back to the early 2010s. In 2013, Ella Catton became the second ever New Zealander to win the Man Booker Prize and became the youngest person to win the prize at 28 for her historical novel, the Luminaries. The Luminary still casts a shadow over previous Booker winners be because it's also the longest book that's ever won the Man Booker. Although her publishing history has been few with Burnham would be in the third ever book, I would say that Ella Catton has a very strong and steady backlist. Moving from the school days of Ella Catton with the rehearsal, which I think it isn't as red as it should be. We then have the astrological historical thriller of the luminaries which I have done a review and I will leave it down below for you to watch. Once you've won the book there is definitely some eager anticipation to what the next book is going to be. And the luminaries being set in 1866 I don't think many people are going to expect that Alan Catton is going to move the narrative 151 years into the future. From the historical we move up to New Zealand's contemporary in 2017 is where Burnham Wood is set. If you've been put off by the luminaries due to its size I would definitely recommend picking up Burnham would. You get exactly what Elna Catton does best at half the size. This being said, some of you might have already been engaged in Elna Catton's work because she wrote the screenplay for the 2020 version of Emma, which I know was well received by many. I'm aware that it's a bit of a stretch to say if you like the screenplay, you would like her books because Film Up definitely has a lot more hands on it in its production. But nevertheless, if you liked Emma, I think you would like Elna Catton's novels. Burnham Wood, the beady-eyed Shakespeareans among us might already be going, this is a Macbeth retelling. I'm so glad to say, no it's not. Those who have better things to do in life than read Macbeth, Burnham Wood is the forest that moves. It is Macbeth's downfall. However, Burnham Wood is a guerrilla gardening collective. Mira Bunting runs Burnham Wood. Who plant crops where people wouldn't expect to find them within people's backyard, on the side of the road, but they're very poor. They don't have much money and it's always a struggle every month to break even. As such, pertaining to the gorilla aspect of Burnham Wood, they steal resources where they feel fit. Like is anyone really going to miss a cow pet in the middle of a field to be used as fertilizer for some crops? Probably not. Luckily, or possibly unluckily, two things are going to occur that's going to change the route of Burnham Wood. The first is that in the town of Thorndyke, where Burnham Wood are set up, there is a landslide that segregates the town off from the Korowai Pass. The landslide not only brings a ton of fertilised land into Thorndyke, but it brings an idea. Idea, an idea the Burnham Wood could use this abandoned, unwanted soil as a farming initiative. Mira assembles Burnham Wood and at the meeting, the hooey, she invites this idea, but in her pocket is an offer of 100,000 New Zealand dollars. We've already mentioned that Burnham Wood struggles to make ends meet, so how on earth has $100,000 appeared out of nowhere in order to achieve this farming initiative? Well, Mira isn't the only person interested within this piece of land. Let's bring on Robert Lemoyne. He is the Elon Musk of this story. Lemoyne is an eccentric American billionaire who wants this land in order to doomstead. Doomstead and be in the tomb where people build up properties for the end of the world and Lemoyne wants to build a huge mansion with a network of underground rooms of mass proportion that when the apocalypse happens that he'll be safe and will still live in luxury as the rest of us burn. Lemoyne is matter of fact and tells Mira straight up front that's the reason for this land and that's the reason she should not be trespassing on it for Burnham Wood. However, Lemoyne is a businessman and is very aware about reputation. Feeling a sense of philanthropy, Lemoyne gives Mira £100,000. There's no contract. They don't actually have to start using this money for the farm. Lemoyne doesn't sugarcoat it. He can lose £100,000. It means absolutely 
nothing to him. His drone company, Autonomo, makes that money in a day. Mira, seeing that she can literally lose nothing from this, accepts the cash and goes to Burnham Woods Hui. Lemoyne only now has to convince his business partner, the person he's buying the land off, to create his end of time bunker, Sir Owen. Darvish. Sir Owen Darvish got his title for what he has done in terms of conservation. Captain does provide a healthy dose of irony by saying that although he is knighted for conservation, the reason why Darvish got his wealth and his position is through his pest control company. Yes, the person who was knighted for conservation is the exact same person who is eradicating biodiversity across New Zealand. The Darvishes, Sir and Lady, feel a sense of patriotism in working with Le Moyne. The fact that this billionaire from America is willing to give Kiwis the time of day, the fact that Darvish really has all the power in this situation gives him a sense of authority and gives him a sense that New Zealand is finally making it onto the map. Some people are skeptical of this, especially Tony. Tony was one of the founding members of Burnham Wood with Mira. He's left Burnham Wood, he's left the country for a number of years, but now he is back. And his first time back at the Hui is when he realizes that Mira has been given a hundred thousand dollars. Tony views Burnham Wood not as a conservation group, but a political group and tries to convince everyone that in accepting this money goes against all of the socialistic aspects, all of the philanthropic aspects that Burnham Wood has built into its bones just to bend over at capitalism because someone has the money. Tony is very quickly turned upon because a hundred thousand dollars is a hundred thousand dollars is a hundred thousand dollars. Tony isn't convinced in the slightest, so decides to do some investigative journalism and tramps through Korowai in order to find out why would someone give someone that they've just met a hundred thousand dollars with no paperwork, no contract. Something shifty is going on. Tony realizes that the autonomous drones above him seem to be doing some survey and he's just encountered a guy with a gun overlooking a facility that no one seems aware of. Tony feels as though he's uncovered something. Knowing that Mira is now in cahoots with Lemoyne, Tony puts a phone call into Owen Darvish. Owen Darvish only picks up the phone because he's panicking, because his deal with Lemoyne is meant to be secret. No one is meant to know that this is happening. But somehow, some guy in the middle of the woods has joined the dots together. If you've read any cattle, you will know that Mkatten has an absolute craft when it comes to plot in regards to how that plot operates and what information is to be fed to the reader ever so slowly. Where we had shifting perspectives within the luminaries, we have that within Burnham Woods, but there's a different aspect that the luminaries could never ever implement and that's technology. The majority of Burnham Wood is misinformation. It's actually effective miscommunication. People are talking to each other continually. They are emailing, they are on the end of the phone, they are texting. But what happens if someone sends you a text and you just don't read it at the moment that you should have? What happens when an email goes to the junk folder? What happens when you look at private conversations and realize that the story that is being told to you is twisted? In a world that is so interconnected, someone can know what you did last night by what someone else has seen on social media. In a world where if someone knows your login details and credentials, just by going on to find my phone, they can track everywhere you have been. Burn and wood. I'm giving you an 8 out of 10. Not only do I think that this is a wonder in terms of eco-fiction, but it's nice to see Anna Catton move into the political and the cultural divides that are currently happening. Those conversations are always spoken about online. And what happens when it comes to the real world seems to dissipate. 
is a sense of technological comfort and how safe we feel with technology that becomes increasingly unsettled and perplexing the further we get into the narrative arc of Burnham Wood. Patton captivates the reader throughout the psychological thriller because the characters feel as though their information is correct and when something is given to you the character themselves don't know like you that it's a red herring and all of this just climaxes. The last five pages of this is tension exploded. You are there right up until the last pages trying to figure out what is going to happen to these characters. Alan the Catton's Burnham Wood is eco-fiction done masterfully. It's wonderful.